isomer genetic testing. What to consider before mailing that DNA. Next slide. So I am a clinical genetic counselor at Advocate Medical Group, and I am especially interested in how genomic medicine is implemented into clinical care. So I will be your moderator today. We do encourage uh, questions to be asked throughout the presentation. If you have any questions you would like to ask our speakers, click on the question and answer tab and type a question into the chat box. Questions submitted will be read aloud during the question and answer portion of this presentation. By submitting a question, you are consenting to have the information contained in the question read out loud during the presentation. Please do not submit any personal identifiers in your submission. Please note, as a courtesy to the presenter, all participant telephone lines have been muted automatically. If you should experience any technical difficulties during the presentation, please utilize the question and answer tab to submit any questions or concerns our way. NSGC offers a wide range of educational programming. The information provided in this presentation is not a substitution for medical or professional care, and you should not use the information in place of a visit, call consultation, or the advice of your physician, genetic counselor, or other healthcare provider. It is my great pleasure to introduce Brian Kirkpatrick as our speaker for this webinar. Brian is a genetic counselor, a writer, and a consultant. Through her private practice, Watershed DNA, Brian provides support to consumers of ancestry testing and other direct-to-consumer genetic tests. She also provides clinical genetic counseling through the University of Virginia and Genome Medical. I would now like to turn over our presentation to Brian to begin our presentation today. Thank you so much for that introduction, Vivian. I appreciate it. So DNA, you may not know the details, but you feel like it holds important information. And if you sign up for this webinar tonight, it's likely because you are a curious person by nature and you wanna know more about the secret life of DNA. So I want this to be fun. I want this to be a learning experience and I want you to leave more curious than you were before, but also more empowered. So tonight I'm gonna to provide some context for ancestry testing and other DNA tests you can order at home what is the process like, for example. I want to provide information about things you should know about before you test. We'll go through some of the fine print together. And I want to set you on a path to learning more by providing you with information about where to go after today's webinar. It's a lot to cover in a short period of time, so we may not get to every question, but there will be time at the end for an audience Q&A. So thank you for coming and let's get started. So first I wanna introduce you to my friend, Joe. Joe is my friend who's gonna pop up a couple of times throughout the presentation to help us understand some concepts. And Joe is like you and me. He starts to wonder about himself, his origins, and also a little bit about what his future might look like, and wonders whether a DNA test might help him learn more about himself. So he has an idea. He's heard about DNA testing, and he thinks that he wants to do it. So Joe has learned about DNA testing a couple of different ways. He's overheard conversations about it with, from other people. He's seen commercials on TV. He's poked around on the internet and read about it through social media. So Joe decides he's just gonna jump in with both feet and go for it. So Joe logs onto his computer and he goes to the website of the company where he's decided to test, or he goes to amazon.com possibly, and he puts in his credit card information and orders a DNA kit. And about a week later, a small package arrives in the mail, and in that package is a tube, and there are instructions for Joe to spit into the tube, maybe to scrape the inside of his cheek with a cheek swab instead. And then there's instructions for how to activate that kit online and how to mail it back to the testing company. So Joe does all of this. His sample is sent off to a genetic testing laboratory where his DNA is extracted from that saliva sample and it's run through some machinery that gives information on his genetic code. About six weeks or eight weeks later, an email pops up in Joe's inbo inbox and it says, your results are back, Joe, time to log in and see your DNA results. So at this point, Joe's a little bit nervous. He's excited. He's thinking, maybe this wasn't the best idea. I'm not sure what I've gotten myself into, but now I just have to know what it says. So Joe logs into his online account. What does he see? What he sees depends on the test that he ordered. So there are many different options out there for ordering an online DNA test. 
there are options for finding out your carrier risk for certain conditions. So perhaps Joe did um, carrier screening direct to consumer and he's trying to find out are there risks to, for him to have a child with a rare recessive condition. Perhaps he's really into fitness and wellness and he's ordered a test hoping to find out information that would help him live the healthiest life possible. Maybe Joe was like I was and he got into genealogy and he had heard about using DNA to help with genealogical research and filling in missing gaps in the family tree, or he just wanted to know his ethnic background based on his DNA, or possibly he was doing it for relationship testing. So for example, paternity testing or sibling testing. That might have been intentional or it might have been unintentional. So. Um, what Joe gets back from his result depends on the test that he ordered. So I introduced through Joe's journey a little bit about the process of submitting the DNA test and I'll fill in a little bit more details about the biological underpinnings. So from a biological sample, we can gather someone's unique genetic code from their cells. In the case of a saliva kit, we're getting cells from the lining of the inside of the cheeks, those are epithelial cells, and we're also getting some white blood cells from the saliva in Joe's mouth. Um, the genetic code between all of the cells of our body is for the most part identical, so that it should be pretty clear cut that a sample from his white blood cells or his skin, skin cells or epithelial cells would match. There are some rare exceptions. For example, people who have had a bone marrow transplant might have different cell DNA in their cell lines. So there are some exceptions, but for the most part, his genetic code is the same throughout his body. So from a biological sample in the laboratory, they can separate out the DNA from inside of a cell and then run it through different forms of biotechnology, machinery, and computer programs that help analyze the sequence of the data or do different types of analysis. So this, there are a few different types of genetic test results that laboratories might see. Not all of these are used by the direct to consumer genetic testing market. So starting with one of the earlier, earliest genetic tests on the left here, this is what's called a karyotype. And a karyotype is essentially a zoomed in picture of the chromosomes. And chromosomes are the structure that our DNA is packaged into. The middle type of testing is a type of testing called Sanger sequencing. Sequencing looks at a little bit more in detail. So instead of taking a physical picture of the chromosomes, we're looking at the letter by letter sequence of someone's code. You can focus in on a small portion of the genetic code or look at the entire portion. And then on the right is a type of test that is the most commonly used in the direct-to-consumer test market right now. It's called microarray testing. And all of these tests are still used for different purposes. You don't throw out your hammer and your screwdriver just because you've bought a power drill. You use them all at different times for different reasons. So no genetic test is superior or better than the other. They're just different. And um, there's no one test that can analyze for every single genetic difference that exists in humans. So there are some other tests on the horizon that are starting to emerge that return different types of results to consumers, for example, Genos Research. Um, and there's a similar company in Australia called Genomics, and they're using a type of technology called next-gen sequencing. But once we get the readout of someone's genetic code or the lined up markers that we see, this is where the hard part comes in. What does this all mean? So it turns out that what we gather from a DNA test result depends on how much we already know and where our knowledge stops. And we're, we only understand well how a few thousand of the 20,000 human genes is involved in the way the human body works, so we're still learning and making new discoveries every day. We're finding new and unexpected findings every time we test DNA and learning that other things are influencing how our genetic code gets expressed in our, the cells of our body. So things like diet and exercise and exposures, for example. So this leads me to a main point that I want to make today, which is that DNA can tell you a lot of things, but your destiny is not one of them. So a direct-to-consumer genetic test cannot, is not diagnosing medical conditions for you. In some cases, it might be able to provide an increased risk estimate or lowered, uh, but many different genes are interacting to lead to most 
medical conditions in people. So this is where the hard part comes in. What does all of this information mean? So when we, let's, First, think about this in terms of health. Most conditions people have are complex. They are caused, in many cases, by multiple genes interacting with each other and with environmental factors, which in can include any number of many things. So genetic testing, including pretty much all of DTC tests, are not inclusive of everything possible. So no matter where you test, remember that DTC tests are not predicting your future. I can also apply the same concept to ancestry testing as well. So I'll, I'll review a little bit about what this type of testing is. It's probably it's one of the most common direct to consumer tests on the market right now, but ancestry testing is not your destiny. So a couple of companies are listed here. These are the biggest four companies offering the ancestry tests right now. There are um, some other companies like the company Helix is partnering with the National Geographic's DNA project to provide some ancestry uh, testing options as well. But these might be the ones that you've heard of, seen commercials on TV for possibly. So all of these companies are providing some combination of these three things. Ethnicity estimation, this is the pie chart or the map of the world that shows where your genetic ancestors originated from. So this is not all of human history. If we look back far enough in time, everybody's map is going to show Africa highlighted. But this is, this, this is ancestors in approximately maybe 500 to a couple of thousand years ago where our ancestors were located. The dark shaded regions are the main regions and then the light circled would be trace regions or where a smaller percentage of your DNA is listed. So this is an example of an ethnicity estimate that Ancestry DNA provides. And Ancestry has information available on their website. This is um, referred to as a white paper and it explains how they've made these determinations. But essentially, this is working based on the outcomes of different areas of science, like genetics and anthropology, which is the study of human history. And it's not an exact science, so percentages can vary from one company to the next. And um, companies are improving their understanding and knowledge over time as well. So even at the same company, your percentages can change over time. So don't look at this as the whole truth and nothing but the truth. It is based in science but it is still a developing area. Something else these companies provide are matching databases. This um, is, a, an example of this is a, a database where they're comparing stretches of DNA and how long segments are, and then matching up people that are, have tested at the same company and, and making a list of them available to you if you've tested at that company. You can choose to opt in or opt out of these matching databases. If you opt in, your DNA is compared to everyone else who has tested at that company up to that point in time. So over time, your match list can continue to grow as more and more people are doing the testing. This is an example of what a matching list is like at a company called Family Tree DNA. Uh, this is actually my result, and both of my parents tested as well, so they are my top two matches. The ones underneath are cousins, more distant cousins, and I have identified at least where two of the three of them fit into my family tree. So in a way, this is a form of social networking using DNA as the connection. So after you match up with other people on these databases, you can communicate with each other over email or within a messaging system that the company hosts if you choose to. Uh, both people on either ends have to agree to communicate for that to happen. As you can imagine, ancestry testing is revealing surprises through these databases, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And finally, some aspects that might tell you about health factors would be um, at the company 23andMe, they provide some health and trait reports that are available. Um, and nearly all of the companies will allow you to download a computer file of your raw genomic information from them. So it's not your complete genetic code, it's not your entire genome. They are only testing maybe 500,000 to 700,000 markers through ancestry testing, and that's out of a potential 3 billion genetic letters in our DNA code. So it's really just a small portion of your DNA, uh, but this, still there are some tools out there that some people are using to parse out 
health information from it. So this brings me to the next topic, the topic of raw data and third-party tools. Third-party tools are these independent programs, computer programs that are either located on a website or you can download them onto your computer that allow you to sift through your raw genetic information. So this is an example of um, one third-party tool that's commonly used in the genealogy community. It's called GEDmatch. And there are a couple of different features that GEDmatch can do for you if you upload your raw data. You can compare to other people who've tested at a different ancestry company and have also uploaded their raw data. So it extends the reach of your matching capability to other people. You can also do things like um, predict eye color, which means the, the program will go through different markers that show up and predict what your eyes look like and then you can compare to yourself does this look accurate is you know and that one is a little bit more for fun not really for any medical purposes per se um, and there are, are, are other ways to um, search your ethnicity or your admixture in a little bit more detail so what happens is someone takes the raw data downloads it and then uploads it to a third-party tool these are not regulated they're outside of any regulatory body so there are some um, concerns about about these, um, but they are being commonly used. So now, how about the surprises that can come up with ancestry testing and even through these third-party tools? So we'll visit Joe again. And one of Joe's friends did testing and found out that his father wasn't his biological father. It led to some stress in the family, but now things are going okay. Another person posted online about finding out they had a cousin no one in the family knew about who had been placed for adoption and they discovered them by matching them in a DNA database. Someone else learned that she had been conceived with the assistance of a sperm donor and her parents had never told her, and she found out about this by suddenly having nine half-sibling matches in her database. So these were all siblings who had been conceived with the same sperm donor. So these types of scenarios don't affect most people who do ancestry testing, but I would estimate that perhaps upward of 5% of testers will get a pretty big surprise. So it's worth thinking about ahead of time how you might proceed if you're one of those people who gets a surprise. The DNA is only one piece of the story. How individual people react to that is really important too. So what were the circumstances that led up to that surprise discovery? How did the news come out? Who discovered the discrepancy first. How did it play out on social media? How did it play out in the family? These are things to know that can and are happening when you opt into these matching features of, the, of ancestry testing. And Joe's thinking, what should I do now? The first time he opened his results on his screen, he was asked to make a decision whether to opt in or opt out to this matching database. And so how, how does he decide to say yes or no? And how does he decide how much information to let his matches see about him? Should he use his real name? Should he download his raw data just because it's there? How someone makes these decisions really depends on um, reading the fine print about the test that you take and then deciding for yourself how much risk are you willing to take to possibly get a surprise connection to a DNA relative compared to other information that you might get out of it. So this is the second key point, but it's a rule that all of us break all of the time. I'm guilty myself. For DNA testing, you need to pay attention. The fine print holds the details that you need to know about the security of your data at these companies, the accuracy of your data, especially that raw data, and then ownership of your DNA. And it ought to help you to think about these things ahead of time so you can go about deciding when you do have to make the decision. Joe has decided what he's looking for is a test that's going to tell him the breakdown of his genetic ethnicity. He's not too concerned about the health information right now. Maybe he will care when he's older, but he's heard some that companies are going to own his DNA and they might sell his data or might save his DNA sample and sell it to a pharmaceutical company. Joe wants to know who's going to own my data and how safe is my data going to be. So I'll explain a little bit about how DNA testing businesses operate, and I'm not passing judgment because there are many powerful and helpful things that can come from this process, and there can be a balance, I believe, found between serving the interests of the customers and serving the interests of the company. So when you uh, buy a kit from a DNA company, you're giving them your money and they send you back a DNA kit. 
And um, what you're providing them with is a certain um, selection of your DNA markers. And then if you choose to participate in the research and fill out health surveys or other surveys that they may submit to you online, you um, are providing them data. This data is pooled all together with other people at the company who have also consented. It's anonymized or de-identified, so none of your identifying information goes along with your information, but the DNA markers and the survey responses go together. And this can be marketed to research and pharma, pharmaceutical companies. In return, everybody benefits as well. So the research, uh, researchers in pharma are oftentimes agreeing to share their research, and because of these huge groups of people, the big data can lead to discoveries really quickly, help new genomic discoveries and health discoveries really quickly. Um, the customers at these companies often benefit from getting reports with information about their genetics. Um, there's really good genetics education tools. 23andMe has really excellent 20, um, education tools on their website. You can have uh, access to your raw data. You have the option to participate in research from the comfort of your couch. There's the matching database that's really attractive to a lot of people. And some companies um, offer or provide rep resources to a genetic counselor. So some of the fine print regarding data. Um, I can't cover this entire topic in a short webinar, but what I can say is that every company is different in how they handle and share your data. Has an ancestry database been used by police investigators? Yes, on one occasion we know about. Has someone's personal data been stolen? No, no report of that yet. So there's a difference between what could happen, what has happened, and what will happen. So to make a decision, you have to weigh for yourself the risks and the benefits. And this is an ind individual call. Where is that balance for you between the risks of your information being in a company's database compared to the information you can get out of it? So one way to think about safety is the way we think about credit cards. We all know credit card information can be stolen and can be used by those with bad intentions, but many people still use them anyway because the benefits of being able to carry around and use a credit card outweigh the risks for most people who decide to use them. So what is in the fine print that when you are ordering the kit and then also when you are agreeing to certain participation in these databases, it includes information about the usefulness of the data, the security of your data in their systems, the quality of the data. So pay attention to the fine print, especially about the accuracy of the data if you are thinking of using this for health purposes, you're, it, if you're going to be using your raw data for health purposes. The raw data truly is raw. It hasn't gone through the same quality control measures that a reported result on a genetic report would. So there can be errors in these raw files. The problem is we can't tell where the errors are. They look to the same from the outside as an accurate piece of data. So what a company writes to you about its accuracy, you have to believe it. So when 23andMe and Ancestry are telling you that this isn't quality enough to be used for health purposes, believe them. If you are going to use it anyway, you have to think of this data like you would a screening test. So if you are a woman and you find a lump in your breast, it, you can't use that to diagnose breast cancer. You need to go for further follow-up testing. The same is true for raw data. It's um, can at, at most it can be viewed as a screening test that will need confirmation by a second test or in a clinical laboratory. So um, I'll just point out a few examples of where we've discovered some errors in the raw data that are coming up on a regular basis. And these are snippets from the SNP Snipedia, which is an online encyclopedia of genetic studies. It's be constantly being updated like Wikipedia is. And they're pointing out weaknesses that have been found from raw data files. It's not just 23andMe where these are happening. It, it's only that we've had a test raw data from them the longest and have discovered them since people have been going to medical genetic testing labs, repeating the testing and not finding the same result there. So medical testing labs have safeguards in place to protect against these types of things from um, happening and returning false positive results to people, and raw, a raw data file does not. So this brings me to my final point, and I, 
I don't want what I've shared with you up to this point to scare you away from considering a DNA test, not at all. I'm a test taker many times over, and like I said early on, curiosity is one of the best human traits that there is. And I and so many others have found great use from home DNA testing, but knowing how to use them and what to do the, to, with the results, it's not automatic. You don't learn to drive a car just by jumping behind the wheel and taking it for a spin the first time that you get in the driver's seat. So take that curiosity if you have it and prepare yourself to jump into the journey, but you know that you're going to have to learn a lot along the way. Where do you turn to learn? There are so many things out there. There are great books, there are Facebook groups, dedicated solely to ancestry testing, many of them out there. There's a great one called DNA Detectives. There's um, ISOG. ISOG is the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. Amazing resources that they've developed on their website. Many bloggers in the genetic genealogy community that have covered every topic from A to Z in this area. I have a growing list of resources on my website, watersheddna.com. And really, for health purposes, nothing beats the genetics home reference, really the best, best resource for medical genetic topics. And I would be remiss not to include one of the most valuable, valuable resources, which are genetic counselors. Not every genetic counselor will understand the details of every genetic test. There are thousands of different tests on the market, and each is a little bit different from the next. But genetic counselors are all able to help you think and talk through the decision-making process about having testing, and afterward trying to help you understand your results and get connected to the resources you need. So check if you're gonna choose a company. Does the company you're choosing have genetic counselors on staff? Do they have genetic genealogists on staff? And are services included as a part of the testing? The takeaway points that I want you to leave with today DNA is not destiny. Remember to read the fine print and learn from resources that are out there. And I'm happy to take questions and answers. If I am not able to get to all of the questions before our time runs out today, I um, will be happy to write up some responses and make those available on the um, aboutgeneticcounselors.com website as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brienne, uh, for this amazing presentation. So, and again, as a reminder to our viewers, if you have any questions, you can submit it via the Q&A tab you can find at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so our first question is from a viewer who has a family history of a rare genetic disease. Um, and her question is whether the raw data from, say, for example, 23andMe would hold any value in connecting their family's uh, diagnosis. Um, she thinks that more data is better, but is this type of genetic information still valuable or is it outdated now? Um, as for the question about being outdated, um, it's, I wouldn't view it as outdated. Um, maybe sometimes limited is a better way to think about it. So um, every test company chooses what they're going to include on their microarray chip. Um, many of these are customized chips instead of the standard chip that the company Illumina provides. So not every uh, raw data file is going to be identical. So uh, it really is not com complete in many senses. So I could, I could maybe think of some rare cases where um, if there's already a genetic diagnosis in the family and that particular marker happens to also be on one of these chips, it could be a way of um, searching out that one particular marker the situations in which that's going to work as well as a clinical genetic test are probably far and few between. So I would still recommend if it's a family history of um, a genetic disease, clinical testing is still the best way to go. Um, if you want to start with raw data or a direct to consumer test, know that the process will still end up um, likely leading you to a clinical testing laboratory for that confirmation, um, and also just to have access to genetics professionals who will be able to interpret that particular finding in light of the family history. 
because family history is a really important piece of the puzzle in helping us understand whether to call a genetic test positive or negative. Um, so it's really hard to look at a genetic result by itself and make a call. The family history can be a really big part of that. Thank you, Brian. So it sounds like really having a genetic counselor to help you understanding your test result in context of your family history is very important in this case, right. especially if there's a diagnosis. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Okay. Our next question um, is, uh, what might be a good test for an, an adoptee with limited to no family health history and wants to know anything that might be there? Very good question. And there are um, groups of adoptees who have gotten together and discussed these things online. So there are some Facebook groups specifically dedicated to adoptees using direct to consumer tests for different purposes, whether it be connecting with biological family or trying to get more health information. There are a wide array of genetic tests that are available to anyone, regardless of whether they have family history or not. I'm thinking of things like carrier screening. So if you want to know if you and your partner have a risk of having a child born with a recessive condition, carrier screening is an option to you regardless of your family history. Having ethnicity information is helpful in many cases of carrier screening because there are certain conditions more common in different populations around the world, but there is a movement towards doing more universal carrier screening on everybody, so the ethnicity piece is not quite as critical as it used to be in the past. There um, are some people who are choosing to do an exome test, which is a test that's looking at all of the coding regions, so all of the portions of the DNA that are part of genes. So not every piece of our DNA is inside of a gene. There's large stretches between them. So an exome is not looking at the entire sequence from start to finish, but just at um, important genes spread throughout. And these are, um, we're still in an exploratory phase with this type of testing because we might get a variance or a genetic change that we don't know yet what it means. It might be the first time we've seen it. it um, we might have seen it in other people, but not know if it's, if it's harmless or it, if it has any impact. And it can be difficult without putting that into context. So uh, meaning if we don't have family history or we don't have health history on an individual, we can, we can get results that we don't know what to tell you. So um, some people are okay with that uncertainty and for other people that can be unsettling. So I don't think that there's a one size fits all answer for adoptees. It really depends on um, the level of uncertainty somebody's willing to accept and also their, their purposes for wanting to do the test. Um, some people who might be symptomatic for a medical condition and they wonder, you know, could this be something that I don't know that I carry? Um, or it could be somebody who's healthy and just wants to know, is there anything I should be looking out for in my future? So there's not an easy answer to that, unfortunately. Uh, but there, I, I would say that the adoptee population who's gotten really involved in genetic testing would be a pretty good resource for questions like that as well. Mm -hmm. Sounds like there's a lot of things to consider and some options available, but a lot of things to, uh, just important to know the limitations of it also. Um, thank you. Um, our next question is about testing kids. So what about testing your kids? Should we do it? Should we not? What are things to consider? Yes. So uh, there are lots of different opinions on this matter. And uh, even the National Society of Genetic Counselors has a position statement on um, testing minors and um, comes, comes down with, with a stance that if, if it's a genetic test that's going to predict an adult onset condition or it's going to tell somebody that they're a carrier of a recessive condition, that it should be the child's decision to have that testing. So defer any testing that doesn't have an immediate health impact on that child until the child is old enough to make a, an informed decision on that him or herself. 
There are shades of gray, however, because um, in, in almost all aspects of life, parents can make decisions for their children and that's their right as a parent. Um, you can decide what car seat you buy for your child. You can decide what school they attend. Um, so how should genetic testing be any different if it might impact the way that you raise your child? So I, I, do, see, um, I do see it as a shades of gray. And uh, I think becoming a parent made that, uh, made me see that a little bit more clearly, that there can always be exceptions to rules. Uh, but um, for, and, and that's in the health setting. Thinking about ancestry testing um, is a little bit different because let's say you've adopted a child and um, don't have any information on them. You don't even know their ethnic background and maybe around the age 10 or 12, they start to notice that their friends know about their background or their history or their family and they don't. And maybe that would be important information for that child to start developing their identity as they, as they grow up. Um, I just watched a video today online of a little girl who was, was um, placed at a police station when, or at a hospital when she was born and um, her mother did not provide any information, just said, I cannot take care of this child. And because of safe haven laws, they didn't ask questions. And so this little girl was raised by adoptive parents and she asked Santa for a DNA test for Christmas because she wanted to know more about herself. And the video followed their family through that process. It was really emotional, but it, um, from the perspective of the child, even though she was only nine years old, she was able to put into words how important that DNA test was for her. So I think we need to really s listen, listen to people's motivations and their reasons for wanting the testing and respect them and try to support them and um, support them as they're making the decision. And then even more importantly, I think when the results come back, um, not everybody is able to process or understand that information uh, in the same way. Thank you. Um, our next question is about ancestry results. So what does it mean to be, for example, 13% Irish, 50% Italian, etc.? Does it mean that most of your ancestors were Italian? Yes, yeah, so um, if you, let me find a chart. Um, I had a couple of slides I, I added to the end, um, and then I think this will help demonstrate a little bit more. Here it is, it's a really, I love this. This is just beautiful to me. So what this is, is a type of chart that shows you how much D DNA percentage-wise or ratio-wise that you get from each of your ancestors. So if, imagine yourself standing in the middle, you're that little white semicircle down there, and you look to your left, and those are all of your maternal relatives. So it's your, that first ring is your mother and father. And then a, a, out around them is your mother's parents on this side and your, your father's parents on this side, and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents, and so on and so forth. So, um, if you look out a couple of generations, you see that you're receiving DNA from pretty much all of your grandparents, that, that there's still pieces of DNA evidence from your grandparents that make it down to you. But after you get out a couple of um, generations, certain grandparents start to drop off. It doesn't mean that they weren't your great-great-grandmother or great-great-grandfather, but because of the randomness of the way DNA gets passed down from grandparent to, to their child, to that person's child, uh, you might have representation by some grandparents more than others. Um, and so when, when, when those percentages come back, it's telling us approximately, um, you know, how many grandparents from that region of the world did you have? Um, and you can have, let's say you have a grandparent whose parent, one parent was Irish and one parent was Italian. Uh, and you have a second grandparent the same way. The way that their DNA passes down may not be exactly representative of how, of that grandparent in your life, but approximately. So if 50%, if you're 50% British Isles, uh, that means your most common recent ancestors, um, one, at least one of them or more came from that region of the world. 
I don't know if that has answered um, the question fully, uh, but it is it is something that you need to take with a little bit of grain of salt because um, even within a group of siblings, those percentages can fluctuate significantly. And um, it doesn't mean that something went on in the family that, that they weren't told about. It, it's just the randomness of the way DNA passes down. It's not always exactly 50%, 25% from each grandparent, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Our next question is about genetic discrimination. So what about the risk of insurance companies getting hold of your genetic information and using it against you in terms of insurance coverage or rates? That's a, uh, a challenging question that it, I, I don't have the answer to. So there's kind of like I was talking about before, there's the risk, there's what could happen, what has happened and what will happen. And um, some of that we can know and some of that we won't know until it happens for the first time. So um, I'm not the GINA expert. There are some other genetic counselors that know this area inside and out who would, I wish this were a panel discussion right now because I would turn that one over to somebody else. Um, but it it is something to think about. Um, the these companies are uh, have been successful in resisting um, subpoenas for from police investigations, for example, because they point out that there's no way to prove that a DNA sample came from a certain person. So you can submit a sample with a pseudonym, with a fake name, and no one can ever tie that genetic information to you. So I know some people who are really concerned about discrimination but who still want the testing uh, may use just their initials or may use a pseudonym. Um, I, I can't, I wish I could predict the future. I don't, I, I don't know what could happen with this information, but it is something that I think we need to consider and make sure that we stand behind the GINA law. And um, it was, it's great that we have that law in place. It doesn't cover all potential discriminatory practices that can happen, but it is um, a pre it, it's a good first step in trying to protect people from discrimination. Thank you. Yeah, so it sounds like some protection in place, but it is really a complicated topic and an important issue for people to think about when they do genetic testing. So thank you. I think that um, could be its own webinar. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, there is another question regarding SNPpedia. So if there is, what should one do if one finds an error in SNPpedia? So this is a question relating to uh, an error in the BRCA2 mutation that's still in SNPpedia, even though it seems like many people reported that it is um, not there after doing gen clinical genetic testing. Yes, so um, the people who, who run and manage Snipedia and there are a number of other people who make edits to it, uh, it would be good to notify them so uh, that they can make those updates in Snipedia. That would be my recommendation is to reach out and um, report that inconsistencies are being seen. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is how useful is ancestry testing in detecting non-Caucasian ethnic backgrounds, especially Native American ancestry? This um, it, very common question. People want to know, I, it, why, I have a grandparent who is Native American, why is it not showing up in my DNA? And Ancestry DNA has uh, a YouTube video specifically on this very topic. There's uh, a couple of different reasons it can happen. Part of it, this chart that's still up here on the screen, it's possible that you have that grandparent in your family tree, but there's just not enough DNA that came from them to show up on your test. Uh, in other situations, someone can be uh, raised in a Native American tribe, but not have that um, DNA from that tribe. So many Native American cultures brought people into their tribe and into their family that were not genetic relatives. So even though culturally they're Native American, their DNA may not have been. Um, 
there, each company is a little bit different in how sensitive they are to detecting different ethnic groups in their population. And so I would um, encourage someone who has questions about why their Native American background is not showing up, look for that Ancestry DNA um, video on Native American DNA and that might help um, might help you understand a little bit about the factors that go into why that happens. Okay. And we have a follow-up question just to clarify in an adoptee family. So if you already know the child's um, ancestry uh, status, is there anything else beyond that that they could find uh, from these direct-to-consumer tests? And is the only thing that these tests uh, will be able to tell is the carrier status? At this point in time, the only FDA approved genetic reports that can be returned to consumers are the carrier screens, carrier screening reports that come from 23andMe. Uh, the FDA got involved and, um, and decided that to be able to return a genetic report directly to a consumer, there needed to be certain criteria that were met to show that that report um, was useful and reliable and accurate. And um, many of the companies at that time decided, this was back in the, in the um, 2000, earlier in the 2000s, uh, 2013, um, when they started telling direct to consumer companies, you need to abide by, you need to work with us to be able to do it. And um, some of the companies decided not to continue and F, the 23andMe decided to stay around and work together with the FDA to be able to start returning those re reports. So I feel really confident in the 23andMe reports that um, the, it is what I would consider carrier screening light. So it's not the full carrier screening that you would get in, in a doctor's office or a clinical situation because there are certain markers that are recommended that are not included on the 23andMe reports. But for what is, um, what is reported positive, I feel pretty comfortable with those reports. Outside of that, I, um, I do have concerns about getting health information beyond the FDA approved reports just because there's not any oversight um, outside of that. So a lot of the third party tools are returning what are essentially genetic interpretations, but they, um, if they don't call it that, then they're not in, in under regulatory oversight. So um, I, I'm not saying that it's not possible to find, to find from a, a direct to consumer test a genetic finding that ends up being true. Uh, that has happened, that someone, that their first, the first way they knew that they had a genetic risk factor was from their DTC test. So I'm not saying it's zero, it doesn't happen because it does. Um, it's, it can just be a little bit tricky to, to, to make sure um, that re result that you're getting really is a true positive. Thank you. Um, I know that a lot of our viewers are parents who are very anxious to find these information out for their kids and they just want to provide as much information as possible for them. So I think that's a very helpful um, answer for viewers. Um, our next question is another clarification question. So um, when you mentioned that a rare disease genetic mutation in a family came back as a variant of unknown significance. Does this mean that the genetic mutation is not there or that the genetic mutation is not tested for? Good question. I use terminology there that I forget is, um, is, is normal lingo in the genetics world, but to most people, variant of uncertain significance has an unclear meaning. So a variant of uncertain significance is a genetic finding that a finding that we locate that there's either um, no evidence or insufficient evidence to determine whether that has a harmful effect or n a non-harmful effect. And the language, more lingo from the community, the genetics community is a pathogenic variant. That is a genetic finding or a genetic misspelling that we, we know there's evidence enough to tell us that this is 
this is disease causing. On the other end of the spectrum, there are benign variants where it's a misspelling or a change in the spelling of the genetic code, but it does not have any impact that we have, that the, the, there's enough information to let us know that that's benign. It does not have any impact. A variant is kind of hanging out there in the middle. And um, it, variants are being um, moved into a different category every day. Um, with more and more testing being done, and, and there are databases like the ClinVar database where um, all of the different variations in human DNA are being gathered into these big databases, and um, we can start to see you know, how often is a, a variant being found, and, and can we start to consider moving that unknown finding into one or another. So a variant of uncertain significance is something we have found and we don't know what it means yet. Thank you. Um, and we also have a follow-up question. So for someone who has met with a genetic counselor and have found a genetic mutation that explains a say, genetic disease in the family, um, would it be helpful to test other family members who are not affected? Um, in a, so in both clinically and also using direct-to-consumer testing? It's going to be very specific to the finding. Um, so there are some findings that are very common. So for example, within the Ashkenazi Jewish population, there are particular variants in the BRCA1 and 2 gene that are common within those, in, within those groups. So if we identify uh, someone in the family who is positive for one of those, we would want to consider testing their close first degree relatives and possibly other people in the family. Uh, and a genetic counselor would be the best person to ask who, who else should we consider testing in the family because a genetic counselor would know how certain variants move through families, the inheritance of different types of genetic diseases. And a genetic counselor could put that picture, that entire picture together and really offer um, expertise on who to consider testing and what testing to consider. Thank you, Brian. So that is all the questions that we have for tonight. Um, was there any additional comments you would like to make before we um, end the webinar tonight? I've really enjoyed being able to share this information with everybody, and I'm really glad for those of you who hung through to the end. And um, I love, I love to get questions and to learn. So if there's something that I've said today that you want more information on, feel free to reach out to me, and um, lo would love to connect you with resources. Thank you. And just so our uh, viewers know, a recording of this webinar will be made available online at aboutgeneticcounselors.com. So thank you all for joining us today and have a great evening. Thank you.